Welcome to this lecture series in group theory. In the last lecture, we looked at some examples of subgroups. And in this lecture, we look at a very particular case of it, uh, part of which we discussed in the previous lecture. We will be looking at subgroups of the group Z, the group Z with addition. We'll, we will be looking at the subgroups of this. All right, so let us uh, recall the relevant things that we need for this lecture. So fix some integer and some positive integer D. Then the division with remainder theorem says that there exist unique integers Q and R, which satisfy these two things. First is this equation that A is DQ plus R, meaning divisor into quotient plus remainder, where the remainder lies in this range. Okay. Uh, we also saw that if we have two subgroups, in the last lecture we saw this, that if we have two subgroups of a group G, then their intersection is also a subgroup. And we also saw that if G is an abelian group, then this thing, which is defined in this fashion, you pick an element from H, an element from K, and sum them. By sum, I mean we apply the group operation. We just, for abelian groups, we typically write plus to denote the group operation. It's not necessary, but sometimes, or rather most of the times we do. So this thing is also a subgroup of G, and we saw this, and one can easily prove this. All right, so these are the problems. And now let us get on with the material of this lecture. So let me recall a notation. So we have some uh, some integer z, uh, sorry, some integer n. Uh, we write nz to mean the set. So you pick some arbitrary integer and multiply it with, with multiply that with n, and the resulting, you know, collect all such things in a box or a set. That is nz. So for example, 2z is all the things of this fashion, of this sort, which is all even integers. Integers divisible by two. Okay, and here is a very simple observation that n z is minus n z, and also this is an this is an interesting one that interesting in the sense, uh, not in the sense that it is hard, it's just something very nice. So you have some non-zero integer, then it divides an integer n if and only if this thing contains dz. Actually, it should be the other way around. If and only if dz contains nz. Right, why is that? Because if d divides n, then n equals dk for some k, for some integer k, which implies n belongs to dz, which implies n times any integer, whatever integer you might want to take, and m is in dz for all m, which implies nz is contained in dz. Right. So uh, this is one way. What we have shown is that if d divides n, then dz contains nz. You can do the other way just by reversing these steps. All right, so this is a very nice uh, observation. Uh, note that if n were 0, then of course this is trivial to 2, and, and therefore uh, every non-zero integer divides 0, which, which is a trivial fact. But anyway, I'm just instantiating this in a trivial case. All right, so just to recall, nz means uh, all those things which are divisible by n. And we have this very simple observation that nz is minus nz. And lastly, if an integer divides n, then that is the same as saying this containment. All right. So now what we are going to do is characterize all the subgroups of Z. What is clear is that if you fix an integer n, then this is a subgroup of Z. That is an exercise. This theorem shows that every subgroup of Z looks like this. So you fix a subgroup of Z, then there is some integer n such that the subgroup is actually equal to nz. So let's prove this. Right, so if H is the trivial subgroup, meaning H is this, then clearly h equals 0 z and we are done. So assume h is bigger than that, h is not the trivial subgroup and note that then h has positive integers in it. So why is that? That is because if you pick some integer n, if some arbitrary, let's not call it n, let's let's say d is in h and d non-zero, then minus d is also in h because h is a subgroup. 
So if d is not positive, well then minus d will be positive. So in any case, h will contain a positive integer. All right, and here is a key interesting idea that let, uh, let me call it n here. So let n be the smallest positive integer in h. Let me write it in words. So let n be the smallest positive integer in h. Since there is at least one positive integer in H, there is a smallest one. Every subset of natural numbers has a smallest element. This is called the well-ordering principle. So anyway, this is, so it, it is a legitimate thing to demand that you, you pick the smallest positive integer in H. Okay, and then we claim that, we claim that, we will show that H is NZ. Okay, so let some, um, what should I use? Let m in h be arbitrary. So by the division with remainder theorem, division with remainder theorem, there exist integers q and r such that m is nq plus r, where r is in this range. So we don't even need the uniqueness clause of the division with the remainder theorem, just the existence clause is sufficient. So what do we get? We th Therefore, m minus nq equals r. Now, m is a member of h because we picked it in h. n is a member of h and is in fact the smallest positive member of h. So n times q is also in h because n times q is just n plus n plus n q times. And if q is negative, it's actually minus n mi minus n minus n q times, uh, or rather minus n minus n minus n mod q times. So it doesn't matter. So all I'm, all I'm trying to say is that this guy is a member of H because you have a member of H subtracted with another member of H. So that's a member of H, H is a subgroup. So this left-hand side is a member of H. Great. Therefore, the right-hand side is also a member of H. But if R were positive, then because of this inequality, it would mean that there is a positive integer in H which is smaller than it, N. But N was the smallest positive integer that was there in H, so R cannot be positive, and hence R must be zero. So what we have concluded is that R is zero. I didn't write it, I said it in words. So R is zero and therefore M equals NQ, which means N divides M. So if you pick any thing in H, that thing will be divisible by N, which implies that H is contained in NZ. Because if you pick anything here, it is divisible by N, that's what we just showed, and that is same as saying that H is contained in NZ. But NZ is clearly contained in H because N is a member of H. So NZ is of course contained in H. And this containment, containment sandwich shows that H equals NZ. So finally, we, we deduce that from this containment sandwich that h equals nz and the proof is complete. So this may seem like a complicated proof because of its length, but it's not at all complicated. And it, this is not the only way to see it. One can just, uh, you know, if you fiddle around a little bit, you'll be able to really see what's going on. This is a way to express it formally. And it's a powerful technique, I would say, but uh, it, this this kind of thing shouldn't look complicated and one should rest on this proof as well as the statement of the theorem as long as it takes for one to get comfortable with it. All right. So now let us uh, make some number theoretic connections. So here we are going to connect these notions of groups and all that with the notion of GCD. So here is a statement. You pick any two integers which are not both zero, so at least one of them is non-zero. Then we want to say that this guy so this is a subgroup and this is another subgroup and therefore writing a plus in between makes sense. Z is after all an abelian group. So if you just look at this, this then that, that guy will make sense. So we are saying that this particular subgroup, we know this is a subgroup because you pick two subgroups of an abelian group and quote unquote add them, you get a subgroup. So this is after all a subgroup and therefore by the previous theorem, this is going to look like some DZ for some D, right? Every subgroup of Z looks like DZ for some D. So therefore this is equal to DZ for some D, but we, we claim that that D is actually GCD. Okay, so we need to prove this. 
All right. So by Euclid, there exist integers x and y such that ax plus by equals gcd of a comma b, which implies which implies that gcd a comma b is lying in a z plus b z, right? Which implies gcd a comma b z is contained in a z plus b z. Because the right hand side is a subgroup, and if you have an element in the in a subgroup, then all its you know you can add it to itself as many times and subtract it with itself as many times as you want. So that's what this guy would, would going to be. So anyway, just convince yourself that this implies that. Okay. So we need to show the reverse containment. The reverse containment is also very easy. So let m let's let's not use m and n maybe. Let's use R and S. So let's R and S be arbitrary integers. Then AR plus BS, AR plus BS is divisible by GCT of A comma B. That is in notation GCT A comma B divides AR plus BS. Why is that? Because GCT divides A and B both and hence this sum. Which is to say, which is to say that A R plus B S is contained in G C D A comma B Z, and since R and S were completely arbitrary in the set of all integers, we we see that A Z plus B Z is contained in G C D A comma B Z. So if we look at these two things, star and double star, the two containments actually give us that. A Z plus B Z equals G C D A comma B Z, and we are done. Okay. Lastly, we can also talk about the least common multiple. So again, fix two integers, not both of them are zero. Then the intersection, which we know is a subgroup. This is a subgroup. This is a subgroup of Z. So this is also a subgroup of Z. Intersection of any two subgroups of any group is a subgroup. So this looks like some D Z for some D, but we we want to say that this is actually equal to L C M A comma B. It's a very similar thing as previous one, maybe even easier. Let's see. So, well, first let's so let us show this containment. So let some arbitrary integer in this be chosen. Then a and b both divide n, and it follows that then the least common multiple. Of a and b divides n. So this is a property that we discussed earlier. That if two integers divide an integer, meaning if if you have a common multiple of two integers, then that common multiple is actually divisible by the least common multiple of the two integers. Okay, and again this can be proved using division with remainder. So we have that, and this this implies that n is lying in LCM a comma b z. Since n was arbitrary, the above re above reasoning shows that this intersection. Is contained in that thing. And for the reverse containment, now let m be some arbitrary integer, and we, what we want to do is want to show that LCM a comma b times m is in this intersection. So this will show the reverse containment, and uh, this is clear because a divides LCM. A comma b, and therefore a divides LCM a comma b times m, which implies LCM a comma b times m is an element of a z, and similarly LCM a comma b is also an element of b z, and that's it. So with these two things, we have that, and therefore the reverse containment also holds. So these things are very very easy, but these reformulations help us sometimes. Prove things which may not be either so simple to prove directly, or sometimes it may not be so easy to even see them. At any rate, we will see, we will look at applications of these, which as of now seem trivial sounding.
All right, so this is all for this lecture. As usual, like, comment, share, subscribe. I also have Patreon. The link is in the description below. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.